a lot of religious people are uh, particularly interested in thinking about the end times. Uh, it is, of course, a major theological topic, but some people seem to make it the, the main, if not the only thing, that they seem to think about. Uh, and I'm not sure whether those people are particularly into the prophecies and the uh, explanations of what's happening in the end times. I'm more interested in predicting the exact date when the end of the world might, might happen, or whether they're more interested in just understanding how current events fit into according to somebody's plan and scheme, how, how current events fit into the, the scheme of the end times as they understand it. And of course, those who are particularly into end times are looking for particular passages in the Bible that seem to talk about the end. The passage that we're looking at today in Isaiah chapter 65 is certainly one of those that's talking about the end. In fact, uh, 65 and 66 are basically focused entirely on the end times. But while Isaiah says a lot about the end, the interesting thing is he doesn't give away much that would help somebody who is trying to work out the times or, or understand the signs of the times. He doesn't seem to be all that interested in people being able to recognise that. What he is talking about more specifically, is about what it will be like in the new creation and who will be there and who won't. Now, of course, Isaiah's prophecy was intended, initially at least, for the people of Israel as they returned from exile in Babylon, as they returned to Jerusalem in uh, rubble, as rubble. And as they returned there in the 6th century BC, as they lived in the, the ruins of Jerusalem, they were waiting for God's great work of restoration and wondering when that would be and what it, what it might involve. And what Isaiah makes clear to them, and then in an ongoing way to, to people ever since, is that God's ultimate plan is more than just about the rebuilding of the temple and the city in Jerusalem. As God's plan unfolds, and Isaiah has already spelled this out to, to some extent, as God's plan unfolds, it involves bringing people from the nations, the Israelites, back to God, as uh, symbolised by the temple there in Jerusalem, but also bringing people from the nations, people who are not Jews, will come to recognise God and come to worship him. They will gather around a raised up banner that God would establish. And what we've come to see in, see in Isaiah is that this banner is actually a person. The spirit anointed Messiah, the great king that God would raise up to rule over his people forever. And what we've also seen is that this great Messiah is also someone who will suffer, the suffering servant, the one who would offer himself as a sacrifice for sin so that not only can people come to God, but they can come forgiven. They can come as people who are welcomed into God's family because their relationship with the holy God has been restored through his work. And so as we look at uh, this section from chapter 65 and 66 next week, what we'll see is that the, the picture is, is similar to, to things we've seen before, for example, chapters 56 to, uh, to 59, where the Lord's people, who are often called his servants, are set alongside those who are either compromisers amongst his people or just outright pagans. But what Isaiah shows us, what God says to us, is that it won't always be that way. Those two groups won't coexist beside each other forever because the time will come when the Lord will bring his servants into the new creation. 
into a new Zion, a new Jerusalem. While those who continue to reject God will have to face his judgment. And so what we're seeing as we come to the end of Isaiah is, the, is a foretaste, in fact, something that looks forward very much to the work of Jesus at the end. Just as earlier in Isaiah we've seen uh, descriptions and, and uh, explanations of what would happen in Jesus' birth and the significance of that, in his ministry as, as king, and then in his work as the suffering servant on the cross. And now we're seeing... Uh, the significance of his work as the king who will bring the end times. But before we look at the the New Testament application and significance, let's look at what the Old Testament passage is saying uh, in its own terms. So it would be great if you've got Isaiah 65 open there. I won't be able to go into detail in what everything that it says, but uh, we'll start with with verse 1 where we see that At the beginning of the chapter, God, in a sense, answers the question, the prayers that were being uh, said back in chapter 63 and 64, the prayer for God to reveal himself, the prayer for God to come down from heaven for his people. And God answers that at the beginning of chapter 65 by saying, Uh, Speaking directly, he says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me, to a nation who did not call on my name. I said, here am I, here am I. And what we are seeing is that God speaks. He does reveal himself. He has revealed himself in many ways and at many times. And he's revealed himself to people who weren't necessarily looking for him. And so we think of uh, some of the, the great encounters that God has with people in the Old Testament. Uh, classic ones being when God reveals himself to Abraham, calls him to, to follow him, to leave Ur and to come to the Promised Land, and also as God reveals himself to Moses you remember that Moses wasn't particularly looking for God in any way in fact he had sort of run away from his people and was just sort of chilling out in the desert and God spoke to him out of a burning bush that didn't get burnt up Moses wasn't looking for it but God chose him and spoke to him and of course God chose people to be his to be to to come into covenant with him to be blessed by him people who while they might have at times thought about God, often they suppress that knowledge. Now, there's a bit of a debate here whether this uh, description of those who did not ask for me refers specifically to the uh, people of Israel, because God certainly did call them and he spoke to them, but, or to the nations, the, the other nations as well. And in one sense, it doesn't matter because there's, there's a reality. This, the scriptures say to us that even though God might not have spoken directly to the nations, God has revealed himself in, in various ways. Through his creation, through the majesty and wonder of creation, God speaks. And everybody has a chance to know something about the true God. And yet, people respond inappropriately. That's what uh, God goes on to say there in verses 2 to 7. This offer that God speaks and invites people is given to people who have rebelled against him. So all day long, verse 2, I've held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face. It's interesting to to see that description, people who are obstinate, stubborn, people who choose to do things that are not good, that are bad, that are evil. They pursue their own imaginations. In fact, they make up ways to uh, worship God or connect with the gods that God does not tell them to. The Lord, in fact, deliberately tells them not to worship other gods, not to 
use idols to worship other gods, and that is what people always do. Whether you're talking about the Israelites here or whether you're talking about the, the pagan nations, that's what people have done. Obstinate, doing evil, making up their own version of religion. What does God do to people like that? Well, he has spoken to them. And he continually does hold out his hand, uh, even to people like that. People who, uh, as he says, offer sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, worshipping God in ways that he, he would never want. Um, even spending, uh, sitting among graves trying to commune with the dead, I think is what's being said there, who eat the flesh of pigs. In other words, they don't follow God's uh, food laws that specifically applied to the people of Israel but who say, keep away, don't come near me. I'm too sacred for you. Who think that they know religion, even though they don't want to know the one true God. And how does God respond to that? How does God think of that? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible smell in God's nose, is sort of what is being said here. But when people do that, then what God will do is he will allow them to have what they choose, that is to be separated from him. Because of what they do, it will come back into their laps as payment for their deeds. God offers mercy despite the sin of people. He offers mercy and forgiveness. And and there will be some, though, who do turn back to him. There will be some who are saved. That's what's being said there in verses 8 to 10. Uh, His servants, especially uh, the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel, even amongst them there will be perhaps only a remnant. Many of them will turn away from him, but there will be a remnant. God will make sure there is, who do want to worship the Lord. And it's uh, the, the illustration, the image that he gives here is of a cluster of grapes that seems as though it's not going to give any juice. Uh, Perhaps they're already shriveled up a bit. You might look at them and think, oh, if only I'd dried them properly, they might have at least made uh, decent sultanas or something like that. But no, here's a bunch of grapes and maybe we should chuck it away. And somebody says, no, wait. There still might be some blessing, some juice left in it. Don't destroy it. Well, in the same way, even though the people look like they have turned away from God, there will still always be a remnant. God will bring forth descendants from Jacob and Judah who will, well, receive the inheritance. The image of uh, the flocks from Sharon to the Valley of Achor, it's from the east to the west of Israel. It's the, over the whole nation there will be blessing for the people who seek the Lord. And you see what God is saying here. He has spoken, but most people, many people, have ignored him and rejected him. And yet there are still a few who seek him and will receive the blessing. And yet, for those who continue to forsake him, verses 11 and 12, especially by consulting mediums and and other gods, for those who continue to forsake him, perhaps they go looking uh, for the gods of fortune and destiny, And in this interesting wordplay, God says, if that's what you're doing, your destiny will be the sword. You'll face judgment. Because, verse 12, I called but you did not answer. I spoke but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. We can't avoid this word of judgment here on those who continue to reject God's offer of forgiveness. If only they would turn back to him. If only we would turn back to him. Because for those who continue to reject God, there will be judgment. In contrast, from verse 13 to the end of the chapter, there is an emphasis on the joy that God's servants will experience as he brings them, as he brings us, into his new creation. Now, in the first verses, he talks about it in terms of a contrast. 
between his servants and those who have been rejected. So verse 13, my servants will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you'll be put in shame. My servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you'll cry out from anguish of heart. The word for God's servants, for those who have listened to God's call, is joy, rejoicing. Plenty of food, plenty of drink, it it will be all good. But for those who reject God, they will they will suffer. It's so good that at the end of verse 16, God even says, For the past troubles will be forgotten and hidden from my eyes. What was suffering in the past, the terrible things that the people went through because of their rebellion, will now be put away. And even God will put away any remembrance of their sin, I think, so that they can enjoy what he has prepared for them. And what God has prepared for his servants, well, verse 17, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem, take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. You see what the overwhelming theme is here? It's the theme of joy and rejoicing. Because God has established or will, will create the new heavens and the new earth. Sometimes we think about heaven as the place that we'll go when we die and there's nothing wrong with uh, using that terminology but the more accurate biblical terminology, the long version of it if you like, is the new heavens and the new earth, meaning the new creation. There will be a continuity with this creation, the old creation, but there will be a difference. This creation has all sorts of problems with it. For a start, there is sin in the world and so there is suffering, there is pain, there are tears. There are all sorts of things in this world that make it not what it should be. But the new creation will be the perfection. Perhaps what the old creation was like in the beginning before sin entered into the world. Perhaps even better than that. But certainly what there will be or what there won't be is suffering and pain. What there will be is joy. And so the idea that uh, if you only make it to 100, you'll be considered, well, you'll be sad. (laughs) I mean, I don't think in the new creation there is going to be uh, death like that. I think those who are in the new creation will continue on uh, forever. But the imagery is of, well, you know, a hundred-year-old will just be a, 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 young, a youngster. Uh, it's interesting. Like, for, for as the days of a tree, you know, that's the sort of time that uh, people will live. There will be no suffering and there will be no harm on God's holy mountain. In fact, this, this fantastic image of the uh, lamb and the wolf feeding together, that's not part of this creation, is it? You don't put a lamb and a wolf in a pen together and expect the lamb to to do well out of that Um, the lion doesn't eat straw like the ox that's not how it works in this creation lions go looking for things to kill but that will be gone in the new creation because things will be perfected and so friends when we talk about what we have to look forward to for those who have been rescued and saved by God this is it It's the new creation where there is no more tears or suffering or pain. Isaiah's vision is is, uh, it's breathtaking really in its scope. It is the new creation. Having said that, Isaiah isn't saying that everybody will be there. What he's saying is that God's servants, the ones that God has called and the ones that have listened to him, they will enjoy this new creation. 
Sadly, there are many who, who don't listen to what God is saying, who don't listen to God's invitation, who don't accept God's offer of forgiveness and mercy. They continue to be, well, stubborn. They continue to do evil. They continue to make up their own religions in opposition to the Lord. And what Isaiah is saying here is that they will face his judgment. Their destiny will be darkness just as much as the destiny of the servants will be light. Their destiny will be suffering as much as the destiny of the servants is joy and harmony and peace forever. It's important to notice that that the line that divides here is not on the basis of race. It's not about which nation you belong to. It's not political. It's personal. It's about how we respond to God, to his word. The New Testament would say it's about whether or not we have faith in the Saviour, whether or not we have put our faith in God. Because Isaiah has made clear throughout his writing that the important question is how we respond to the Lord's King, to the Messiah, to the one that God will raise up, does raise up, has raised up. Because, of course, the Messiah is also the suffering servant who suffered for our salvation so that we could have forgiveness, the one who died on the cross. Of course, he's pointing us to Jesus. And when we come to the New Testament, we see also that Jesus is the one who brings in this new creation. Because when he comes, when he returns, he will come as both saviour and as judge. He is the one who will destroy evil, who will put it away. And he is the one who will invite and welcome his servants, his people, into the new heaven, the new earth. It's interesting, uh, when you come to Revelation chapter 21, you see this idea, and this is a direct quote from uh, Isaiah. Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. There, of course, the new Jerusalem that comes into this new creation as I've suggested before, is, I think, the people of God. It's not a city as such. It's the people. Because they are beautifully dressed for her husband. Who is that? Well, of course, it's the Messiah, Jesus. He is the one who welcomes us in to the new creation. And what will it be like there? Well, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And God will dwell with his people. They will be his people and he will be their God. That is the image of the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation. God dwelling with his people. The people who have been gathered and saved and rescued through the work of the Saviour, the Messiah. And of course, for that to be perfect, it means that there will be no evil there. Those who have rejected God, continue to rebel against him, will be shut out. Now that's not something that people like to hear these days, but it's what the scriptures tell us. Those who continue to reject God will receive what they want. That is, they'll be shut out from his presence except that being shut out from his presence will mean suffering. They will miss out on the joy of the new creation. So friends, that's why I urge you each week to trust in God, to rely on him, to put your faith in him, to accept what Jesus has done for you as your saviour and your Lord. And that's why I encourage us all to be looking for opportunities to share this good news with those around us because it is of eternal significance. How people respond to God and his word determine our eternity. 
that's something that we can all put some thought into, isn't it? Both for ourselves and for those that we love, those that we meet from day to day. Something to be praying about. Let me encourage us all to do that and let's pray now. Father God, we do thank you that you are the God who reveals yourself, that you have revealed yourself to all people and you have especially revealed yourself in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we've had the opportunity to turn to you in repentance and faith. We thank you that we're able to put our trust in you and be forgiven. Father, we pray that you help us to persevere in this. And we pray for those around us, and especially our loved ones who have not yet responded in faith, who have not yet received this message. Father, we pray that you might speak to them, open their ears to hear what you are saying, that they might know this joy of your eternal salvation as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory.